Well, of course, uh, you will all be disappointed after hearing such a great introduction because I couldn't possibly live up to it, but I will try. So as uh, Gary told you, um, I have been studying creativity for a very really long time. And um, uh, partly this was because many members of my family had been artists and uh, either professionally or, or on the side. And during World War II, when I was a child, I, I was uh, impressed by the fact that uh, most people lived lives that were incredibly fragile, incredibly vulnerable to the vagaries of the war and uh, uh, all the terrible tragedies that came after that and during it. And so I've been, as a child, curious to say, why can't we have a life that is uh, more uh, beautiful, more meaningful, more, uh, be uh, more uh, true than what most people are living? And I thought that by studying creative people, I could get some intimation, some uh, idea of what such a life may be. Now, if you think about the role of creativity in human life, um, you should try to remember the fact that uh, people who work in genetics tell us that we share between 95 and 98 percent of our genetic material and organization with primates, with chimpanzees, with uh, the uh, great apes. So in, biologically, we are almost undistinguishable from uh, other life forms. And yet, the way we live, the kind of things that our species has created, uh, cathedrals, symphonies, uh, spaceships, are of a completely different order of magnitude than most other life forms. And the reason for that really is that we can learn and we can transmit the ideas of previous generations so that we can build a culture, a culture that contains the experiences, the uh, mistakes and the solutions of the previous generations of our ancestors. And these uh, keep uh, new ideas, new uh, life forms, new uh, discoveries can get integrated into this ongoing process of evolving culture. And this is why, where creativity, of course, comes in. Creativity is the process by which our life evolves, uh, our culture changes and grows. So I will be talking tonight mostly about creativity of that kind, that the, the creativity that changes the culture in which we live. And we can think of that as a big C creativity, as opposed to the little c, the small c creativity, which is really something that all of us do more or less during our lives, but which doesn't have an effect outside of our own life. Uh, the kind of new ideas, new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing the world that we can have in our own life which we may protect and, and keep as a very important and enriching experience is very important, the small C creativity. It's, it's incredibly important to make our lives richer and better. But those moments of insight and revelation may not change anything be, besides our own life. And that's not a small uh, our own lives are, of course, the most important things that we can have control over. But the big C creativity is interesting because it's what pushes the whole species, or at least our culture, uh, ahead into new directions. So let me maybe get to the first one of these uh, slides. And uh, so this is what I was saying that. Uh, there are these two forms of creativity, and for most of, most of our lives, the small C is more important. But tonight, I want to focus on the big C, which is what 
most people actually study. You can go to the next. And um, so big C creativity, the way we, or anybody who studies creativity more or less agrees, is that you can define creativity with a big C in these three ways. Namely, something that is relatively rare, unusual, statistically infrequent. And um, at the same time, that it's valued by society and that it's an idea or product or act activity which is completed. It's not just an idea that you forget about next day, but it's, it leaves some kind of a trace, a poem, a painting, uh, an invention. Now, this simple definition is of course full of booby traps. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's not an easy thing to, to actually um, use this definition because the first thing it says it's rare. So how rare does it have to be? I mean, we, there are some ideas, some discoveries which change the culture completely so that we see the world in completely new ways, that we understand reality in completely new ways. Are those the ones only that we should call creative? How far down we should go before we say, okay, after this creativity becomes small c or it doesn't really affect the way we live? So that is, that is a question to, um, that ha hasn't been satisfactorily answered, but obviously we have a we can assume that the more it changes the way we think, feel, see the world, the more important uh, contribution or more creative it will be. The second one says it has to be socially valued, but who is to determine what is socially valued? And that's a very contested issue because um, there are great differences in opinion, and so there has to be a way of adjudicating whether this new idea, product, is really better than what existed before. Because if it's not better, uh, we don't have enough capacity in our brain to remember or to, to celebrate or to learn the, the idea if it's not new and, and useful. So somebody has to make the distinction, that judgment. Um, in, some, in some realms of human activity, it takes maybe three or four people to decide whether something is creative and that works for everyone. For instance, when Einstein wrote his uh, theory of relativity, it, it's generally, uh, uh, generally thought that only four physicists in the world really understood what he was doing. And these four tended to be where um, high professors in Germany and England who could uh, put their stamp of approval and say, yeah, this is great stuff. It's, it's new and it's valuable. And then that judgment of these few people really understood kind of filtered down and within a couple decades, uh, the people on the street knew Einstein's name, it, even though they didn't understand at all why he was famous or what, what contribution he made. But there was this small group of people who had the chance to uh, put their uh, imprimatur, their uh, stamp on that work. In other fields, uh, it can be extremely dispersed, the number of people who make judgments. For instance, in consumer products, when you bring in a new car or a new soft drink, uh, and you expect, well, will this work or not? Well, it won't work if uh, four or five people say this is a, a better Coke than what was before. You have to have a mass uh, agreement of the, of, of the consumer, the market, to decide whether this is really better than the old Coke. So, um, and then whether something is completed, here there is all, all kinds of intellectual property debates uh, um, which go as far back as antiquity where 
uh, people argue who really was the first one to have this idea, who was the first one to propose it, who was the one who really completed it, and uh, it can be very contentious. So even those, this small uh, kind of very innocuous looking definition is very difficult actually to work with, but this is the one we work with anyway. So we'll go to the next. Um, I just wanted to show you this illustration which comes from uh, a book by Charles Murray called The Human Achievement, and he reproduced it from the work of a statistician who lived in the 30s uh, called Latka, which Latka studied the number of publications in chemistry first, and then he went to other sciences. But, um, and he found this interesting curve that repeated itself in every uh, branch of science that he studied. And since then, it has been replicated outside of science, also in other, in other um, realms of endeavor. What this curve shows is that about six, over 60% 60 of the contributions, let's say, to chemistry, which was the first thing that over 60% are, um, no, okay, sorry. What we're saying is that over 60% of the chemists who publish at least one article or book, over 60% only publish one in their lifetimes. And then uh, when you get to how many publish five articles in their lifetime, and you find that it's about 5%. And then this curve becomes asymptotic, that it almost goes down to zero. It takes a long while. There are some chemists who publish 30 and some who publish hundreds of articles, but there are very few. And the interesting thing about this curve, as I say, is that it recurs in almost every group, every uh, area of contribution. Uh, it works like this. So what, what you're saying is that most people who contribute to a particular domain contribute very little, and very few are the ones who really do the bulk of the contribution. If you look at the next slide, uh, Derek de Sola Price, who is a political scientist, developed this law, which is called Price's Law, which is another way of putting the same thing that Lotka is doing with the curve, but uh, Price did it independently, and he found that um, in any kind of group that does something like writes rock music or does uh, write scientific articles or paints or whatever, um, that half of all the contributions in that uh, field are made by the square root of the people who are in that group. So let's say that there are a um, hundred a piece of music being written in a certain style in a... If there are 100 songs written, then 50 of them will be... Uh, if there are 100 people in the group, sorry. If there are 100 people in the group of uh, practitioners in that realm, half of the songs will be written by 10. That is the square root of 100. And what's interesting about this formula is also that the larger the group, the smaller the number of people who are actually doing most of the work. And this is a kind of a thought-provoking notion that somehow there is a kind of a elitism in what in uh, contributions to any field, whether it's music or, or physics or psychology. Um, that is, there is a kind of a funnel that makes it so that 
most of the people I work there don't add much to that particular domain and, and almost most of the work is done by a small group. Now, if you were a cognitive psychologist or um, most people would assume that this is because some people are geniuses. There are a few geniuses and those do a lot of work and everybody else does just a little tinkering around the edges. Um, but there, is, there are other ways of explaining it, um, not completely, but um, in my opinion, it's not so much the difference between the genius or the innate ability of people that results in this, but it's more a sociological or a group phenomenon which says that in any kind of uh, activity, uh, there was a famous uh, sociologist that, that passed away recently, Robert Merton, who called this the Matthew effect. Uh, um, from the New Testament, the uh, Gospel of Matthew, which says something like, those who have will be given more, and those who have little will be taken away from. And that Matthew effect is uh, at work in all, all kinds of groups like this, where once you begin to produce, and if you have certain characteristics, either personal or you are lucky, as uh, Gary mentioned at the introduction, you are going to be um, kind of snowballing to greater and greater recognition and effect uh, on the culture, effect on the particular culture. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much about the cognitive aspects of creativity. There is what goes on, you know, what mental processes goes on in the mind of the person. I'm interested in motivation, I'm interested in personality, and then I'm interested also in the context, in the social context, cultural context that makes creativity possible. Um, so maybe let's see what comes next. Uh, um, the, the, uh, finally, after many, many years of trying to understand creativity, I came up with this uh, model of how creativity works, really. Most psychologists have been interested in a creative person here, to the left, or right, actually. Um, that is what makes a creative person able to come up with new ideas, etc. Well, first of all, creative persons, in my, in my experience, in my study, don't think ever exist, at least big C creative persons, never exist in a vacuum. They are not creative across the board. They are creative in a, ver in a restricted area of human achievement. And those areas of achievement I call domains. That is, uh, a domain is a way of doing things which exist in the culture and which you can learn. Domains, every culture is made up of thousands of domains, tens of thousands of domains. Uh, obviously, mathematics is a domain, but then mathematics is subdivided into many subdomains like numbers theory, algebra, etc., etc. So, um, you can't be a creative mathematician and change mathematics unless you absorb knowledge from the domain that you are operating in. So the domains which are embedded in the culture transmit information, and the person learns the information. The people in general uh, learn some, more or less of it. And most people are really very happy to just function with the information they learn. They don't want to change it. They think it's fine as it is. They learn uh, mathematics as taught in school and they, you know, they forget it a few years later or they use it as they were given. But then some, pe some individuals feel that, gee, you know, this is interesting, but 
I think I can do better. That is, they feel that somehow the knowledge is not really well integrated or well done enough. And often it's because you, you feel um, that you don't quite understand it the way it's, it's done. For instance, even Einstein, when he was asked why he bothered spending so many years developing the theory of relativity, he said, uh, maybe jokingly, but in a sense earnestly, he said, I did it because I couldn't understand physics the way it was taught. You know? There were gaps, there were anomalies that he could not deal with, and so he had to think through, how can I rethink the way uh, forces interact in the world in a way that I can make sense of it myself. So, a few people are those who, because of genetics, environment, or uh, whatever else, which we can go into later, but we don't really know that much, the genetics of creativity. And we have very interestingly uh, contradictory notions about what environment produces creativity. For instance, in my studies, I find that creativity tends to come from the two ends of a normal distribution of family life, of uh, how good a family life it is. So you have creative people coming from the most rotten families and those coming from the best families. And the big middle ground is very scarcely represented uh, among creative people. Nor, and the same thing with just socioeconomic conditions. You, you have very uh, well-to-do, ex uh, exposed to the latest uh, ideas and, uh, and, and opportunities. An even bigger group from dispossessed uh, people who, who have a really hard time. And again, the middle class, the, the bigger central portion of the social milieu, doesn't seem to produce as many creative people. And there are good reasons for that. Let's not go into, go into it. But the point is that some people are come up with this notion that they can do differently or better. And they are the ones who produce novelty. Now, this is a small percentage of the population, but even so, it's, it's a much larger percentage than can be actually paid attention to by society, by the culture. As for instance, in one of the latest census says, um, about half a million Americans say that their job, their profession was to be an artist. Half a million, 500,000 artists in, in the US. When um, a, uh, a couple of years later, the Gallup poll asked a representative sample of Americans, how many living artists do you know? And the average response was 1.8 living artists. And actually, ha the, almost half of that those artists mentioned were Picasso, who had been dead for 20 years and wasn't even American. So the question of you know, the, the incredible kind of bottleneck that exists between the production of novelty on the one hand and its adoption by the culture. Because see, if you are a painter who nobody knows, and not even uh, maybe your in-laws, no, um, you're not going to change the culture. I mean, it's not going to enter the culture. It's going to be something satisfies you, makes your life rich and, and much better, perhaps. But it's, it's not necessarily big C, you know, creativity. OK, so you have the half a million, let's say, artists who produce work uh, paintings, sculptures in the U.S. And before that work can become part of the domain, it has to be passed through the gatekeepers of the art world. And that's what I, the field is. The field is made up of gatekeepers. In every domain, there are gatekeepers. 
Uh, whether it's science, there are referees who look through your articles and uh, foundations who say, this is a good idea, we we'll give you money to, to implement it. Um, uh, for artists, the gatekeepers are critics in the newspapers. They are gallery owners who will say, I will do a show for you if you bring me 50 of your paintings. Uh, the gatekeepers are collectors who buy your stuff and then make your name known to others. So the fields are the ones who um, select out of these 500,000 artists those that will be remembered, that will become part of the domain of art for the next generation. In other words, um, if you are selected and your name is known, your work is known, then it becomes part of the art books, the, the courses that are taught in art schools, et cetera, et cetera. And it will be hanging in museums, and so people will say, ah, yeah, I know this guy. And um, then the next generation of people will find in the domain not only what existed before, but also what the uh, next generation has contributed to it. So it's a kind of like a spiral where you borrow from the domain, you tweak it, you change it. If it's selected, then it becomes part of the domain and the new generation takes, learns from the domain what's there and so forth. So it's a, a slow process of kind of evolution in which new ideas, new products get assimilated into the domain. Now, this is fine because, but it has a, a very important implication. The implication being that creativity, contrary to what most people think, creativity doesn't seem to be um, supply driven, to use economic terms, it's demand driven. In other words, you, if there is a lack of creativity, it's usually not because there are not enough new ideas there. It's because you can't select enough of them so that the uh, culture can change rapidly. I mean, there, is, there are other things we can talk about, but I think that's, to me, one of the major contributions of looking things this way is to make you realize that all of us are responsible in a sense for selecting, transmitting new ideas, not just, they won't happen by itself. I mean, new, new products, new ideas are not going to be adopted unless there is a, a good selection process. Because if the field is not capable of recognizing what's good or bad, or if the field is too stingy in recognizing, or if the, the, sometimes the field is too loose and it will, it will um, um, admit any new novelty into the domain without really checking well, in which case the domain gets kind of <laughs> diluted. But if the field is not capable, either because it's too strict or too loose, then the creativity just doesn't happen. You have lots of good ideas, original ideas, but they won't enter the culture, they won't change the culture. And so big C creativity is not gonna survive that way. Okay, well, this is all good and I hope uh, it makes sense to you, but let's go and look a little bit back to the, on the person now, because most people are really interested in the individual creative person, not in the whole system. Although I think the system is more important in many ways. But let's go to the level of the person. And I wanted to show you some, oh, okay, well, yeah, let's go to the next. Uh, we can go to the next. Um, uh, these are 10 characteristics that I found as being interestingly true of creative people that I studied. Um, in the book, I, 
I report and interviews with 91 very creative people who are, most of, many of them are still alive uh, at this point, but they were all in over 60 years, many 80, 90 years old, because I wanted to get people who had creative lives all through, not just one lucky break, so to speak. So what you see here are 10 dimensions on which these people are interestingly different from most of us. And what, what is interesting about it to me is that until now, psychologists tended to see creative people as being at one end or the other end of this continuum, of this spectrum. But what I noticed is the tremendous ability to move from one end to the other, depending on how the requirements of the task they were working at uh, were. For instance, the first one is this thing about their uh, energy. And um, for instance, one of the people in our sample was uh, Linus Pauling, who was 89 years old at the time. Uh, he had two Nobel Prizes, chemistry and peace. But at age 89, he was still incredibly active. He had five major projects he was working on. And he was talking about his work with the exuberance of a seven-year-old. You know, his eyes were sparkling. He was jumping up and down. Um, that vitality and bounce was very typical of him and of all these other people we studied. Uh, as I say, some were 90 years old. Uh, one of them just passed, passed away two weeks ago, Ernst Meyer, a, a biologist who was over 100 when he passed away. But um, they were very energetic till the end and very enthusiastic. At the same time, however, when I asked them, you know, what, when we asked them, what would you like to change about yourself? They said, almost all of them said, sooner or later, they said, I wish I was less lazy. So <laughs> there are these, these people who, you know, have lived for 70 years of incredible active lives, and they're still living it in the 80s. And they think they're lazy. And, uh, and it's not false humility, because you, you ask them, as I did, you know, what do you mean lazy? You know, what, or how come this is something that uh, you think of yourself and say, well, you know, I have a way of living my life, which many people think is kind of lazy, because when I, feel a little tired, I fall asleep. I don't care where I am. Um, I eat when I want. Um, I go off, uh, take a walk when I want. Um, in other words, they have, uh, uh, in a sense, found a way of being able to refuse the kind of regimental routines that most of us have to live by. And, and they feel a little guilty about it. Um, but they have been doing this forever. I mean, even before they were famous, apparently. They were known for disregarding the kind of uh, mechanical responsibilities that we think are, we need, need to live by. They are willing to break out and do their own, they do their own thing, you know, in, in many ways. So, um, most psychologists, to go to number two there, comment on the fact that creative people are uh, um, divergent thinkers. That is, they think outside the box. You know, they, they go, their thought kind of is unpredictable and bounces back and forth. And that's true, it's, it's very true. On the other hand, what is less seldom noticed is that they, when it comes to justifying what they, they are doing and, and this is the, the major part of their work, they become very convergent. That is, they become logical, linear. They don't bounce off all over the place. And this ability to move from one way of thinking to the other is one of the secrets, I think, of what makes them 
able to break out. Um, playfulness, yes. They are very playful, almost naive. Um, in in the way, yeah, that's. Uh, but at the same time, they can be very disciplined and very, very hard working. Um, they have uh, the ability to imagine things uh, uh, differently, to be kind of uh, fantasy, uh, lost in fantasy. But then they. When it, again, when it comes to the part of the work where you have to communicate with the field who will evaluate you, they become very uh, realistic. And most, uh, our image of the creative person is that of a solitary person who lives in a garret and paints alone, you know, or the scientist in his lab. Uh, making Frankenstein monsters or something, all by himself. But I, and that's true, a, a lot of their work requires solitude and focus concentration, but to one, one all of the people uh, I interviewed, all 91 of the people in the book, say that you can't really be creative without constantly talking to other people in your field and enjoying the give and take to uh, learn what's happening, what's the latest ideas, to get the different perspectives. And some people do it on cycles that take weeks. For instance, the physicist uh, Freeman Dyson, he had a cycle of two or three weeks of solitude back in the library where he worked alone in a carol, and then he went back to his office for three weeks. He kept the door open, and whenever somebody walks up and down in the corridor and hears an interesting conversation, he would go out and find out what's going on. So that's a very long cycle. Another person who is in the book is um, John Reed, who was then CEO of Citicor, and he was considered a very creative business leader. Um, and John Reed had a daily cycle. I mean, he said, I get to the office by 7 in the morning, and between 7 and 10, I'm, nobody can reach me. My secretary just routes all, holds all, my, all the calls, and even if the White House called, I wouldn't be really disturbed for three hours. And then around 10 o'clock, he opens the door and he said, I become a tribal chief. In other words, all the people with their problems and their, uh, come and talk to him, and he tries to, to deal with them. So this is um, this ability to move from solitude to gregarious uh, communal uh, problem solving and so forth, that's very typical. These people are very ambitious and proud, but at the same time, they know what Newton, Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton meant when he said that the only reason he could see farther than others is because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. And um, that notion that you owe the previous generations most of what you know, that was very typical, whether you talk to an artist, a musician, a um, scientist. Um, uh, often it has been shown that, or has been remarked on the fact that um, creative people tend to be psychologically androgynous. That is, uh, creative men have traits that in the culture are more typical of women and vice versa, that women who are creative tend to have certain traits of assertiveness, com competitiveness, uh, adventurousness that are tip in the culture in general are not typically trained into girls. So that is that's another kind of uh, uh, dialectical ability of creative people is to be able to experience the world not just as, a, let's say, a boy or a girl, but as a human being, namely having a full spectrum of uh, 
abilities to see and respond to the world. And that's true of all of these things, namely that generally as we try to train our children at home and in schools, we try to kind of pigeonhole them more or less into a type of behavior that will end up being at one of these ends of this uh, continuum. And that's understandable. We need certain amount of predictability and um, in a culture, but it does have the unfortunate effect of also blinding us to half of what the world could be like. And these people are able to move back and forth in a, in a way that is unusual. Um, now here, I wanted to show a few of the interviews that I did um, and some of my colleagues did. And this is one of the first uh, interviews with a very well-known American composer who was one of the leading classical composers of the past 40 years or so. And he was describing how it felt when he was composing music and the composition was going well. And this, this short excerpt comes from a 40-page um, transcript of the interview, but in these few lines, this man kind of really hits the nail on the head and how it feels when a creative activity is going well. And I'm, I ended up calling this syndrome of experience, the flow experience, um, because people used the word flow very often to describe how it felt, like this man does too. He says, and the music just flows of itself when it's going well. Now, this is, um, this flow experience I will be talking more about tomorrow, so I won't spend too much time here. But what I wanted to, to uh, make clear is that this is one of the reasons why people are motivated to do creativity is because they have a, ch a chance to experience this feeling of discovery and um, almost transcendence that comes when you are pushing the envelope, when you're going to new territory. And let me just spend a couple of minutes uh, going through what this guy is saying because I think it's it is important to, to get it. For instance, he says that when he's writing music and it's going well, it's almost as if he didn't exist. And, and it's an ecstatic state. Now, ecstasy sounds like some strange disease you get when you take too many drugs or something. But actually, you know, in Greece, ecstasy was a very simple concept. Ecstasy meant to step to the side of something. And what it has come to mean is a state in which you are not in your ordinary, everyday life, your kind of routine, predictable life. But for a moment, you are standing in a different reality. You are entering a different reality. And so ecstasy is a very important issue, actually, because if you think about all the great civilizations in the world, whether it's Egypt, China, Mesoamerica, the Mayas, um, the, the, whatever civilization, think of what you know about these places. And if you form an image of Egypt or Greece or the Maya civilization, you, what you have in your mind are the results really of the work that these people did to create places they could have ecstasy. It's not so much their everyday life, their economy, their pro productive life, but what you have left are temples, sport arenas, theaters, places where people went to experience reality in a more orderly, more well, organized way. And 
therefore, ecstasies are, the ecstasies that cultures develop are almost the highest forms of what the quality of life of these people consisted of. Now, this man doesn't need a temple or a sport arena to find, to feel ecstasy. He gets it by putting little marks on a piece of paper and imagining in his head how this will sound when an orchestra is playing it. Now, then he says, I, I feel almost as if I don't exist. Well, what is he saying? I mean, that sounds a little extreme again. But really, this is a neurologically based observation he's making here, namely that our nervous system, our brain, is able to process only a very few um, bits of information every second, about 110 bits. But that, to, to understand what somebody's telling you, you have to use 60 bits of information, so you can't hear two people. You can't understand two people talking to you at the same time. When you are doing something that's really involving, like music or any other form of art or science or athletics, you are so taken, your mind is so taken with processing the information you're working with that you don't notice after a while that you have a headache, that you have, a, you have to go to a bathroom, that you're hungry, that it's getting late, you don't see that the sun is setting. All of these things are excluded from your awareness because all your mental capacity is taken up by what you're working on. And when that happens, he says, his hands just move by themselves. And he doesn't have to force them. He doesn't have to direct them. It's something that seems to be happening by itself. But of course, it doesn't happen by itself. This man has spent 20 years learning music and experiencing how to write music. I could look at my hand for two weeks, and I wouldn't feel any awe because I don't know how to write. So you got to have that skill. You have to have that training. And then once you have it, you can forget about it, and it will come out. Um, the Italians have a very nice saying uh, way back in the Middle Ages, which was impara l'arte e mettila da parte, which means learn the craft, which in Italian arte, art meant really craft. And, uh, learn whatever craft you are working in well, and then forget about it. And that's what um, this guy is describing, um, that he can then let go and it goes by itself. And then when that happens, the music just falls out of itself. Now, this kind of, um, this kind of um, experience has been described by uh, any uh, by people who have done a great variety of different things, whether they are surgeons, athletes, dancers, uh, painters, poets. Um, and it, it is um, a very general, uh, no matter what the content of it, whether it's music, it sounds, or the skill of the surgeon, the point is that once you learn it and you are applying it and you're breaking, going beyond what you did before, uh, you do experience this kind of uh, feeling. Let me just end up with another kind of very nice, uh, we have a lot there. Why, could you go a few more? Mark Strand. Okay, Mark Strand is a friend who writes poetry, and he was the poet laureate of the United States at about 10, 15 years ago. And he describes how, how he feels when he writes poetry. And he, uh, he didn't know about Flo when he, we interviewed him first. But what he describes is exactly, um, you know, what I couldn't put it better um, as a 
succinct description. Uh, you're right in the work, you lose your sense of time, you're completely enraptured, ca caught up in what you're doing, you're sort of swayed by the possibilities you see in the work, um, and so forth. I, I think it's a very nice uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, summary of how it feels. And the reason I'm going so much into how it feels, because this is the motivational hook that creativity has on people. That is the ability to experience life with this kind of intensity, this kind of uh, richness that these people describe is why people are willing to give up fame and fortune and the health and often, too often, their families and so forth in order to live on this kind of heightened level of, of intensity. And that's partly why, in fact, creativity is not that much more common, probably, um, because it is, it is something that requires a lot of uh, sacrifices. It, it gives you a tremendous uh, feeling of going above or beyond where you thought humans could go, but at the same time, it, it is exhausting and it is, um, I guess, um, Nietzsche, the German philosopher, coined that kind of phrase that um, our art is a jealous mistress. And this is true of all forms of high achievement, is that you cannot, you know, it's very difficult to, to um, split your attention and your energy when you have the ability <coughs> to experience it this way. Although I must say that <clears throat> in my research with these people, many of whom were really quite creative, maybe not the top of the hierarchy of creativity, but they were quite creative, I was surprised that many of the popular ideas about how dissolute the life of creative people is were wrong. I mean, many of these people have been married all their lives to the same partner, they had grandchildren, they, they enjoyed their families too. But, it must, but this balancing between their creative life and their home life was probably the most often mentioned problem they saw in their lives, that they felt they had shortchanged their children and their spouses to a certain extent. But I guess we all feel the same way, even without being creative often, right? So that is the, um, this, this is kind of a short version, but I've been talking already more than an hour, so I probably should stop here and I welcome the kind of questions that you may have at this point. Okay? Anybody would like to get started? There is stuff. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. That was really very interesting. But I'm left a little bit dangling. Um, if the flow experience is really the reward for private creativity, so creativity with a soft C or a little C, is there a connection between the flow experience and big C creativity uh, in the public domain as we try to, to make our creative ideas part of the culture? Yeah, um, probably I, the transitions were not very really clear in how I presented that connection. But what I can say is that all of the creative people I studied experienced this flow the big, uh, all the big C people experience flow in their work. I remember the very first, uh, one of the first interviews was with um, uh, John Hook Franklin, uh, African American historian who has written some very kind of uh, breakthrough books on American history. And he said, you know, I always say TGIF, you know, thank God it's Friday because on Friday I can go home and spend two days working without interruption. And 
that kind of notion, all of these people say, you know, you could say I worked every day in my life, even in the shower, or you could say I never worked a day in my life, because both are true. I mean, I, what I do is so exciting that I don't need, that I don't need to take off. I, to me, this is like the best of leisure to keep working. But so all of these people experience flow in their work. But flow is no guarantee of creativity. I mean, flow is one part that you need to have. But then you need to have the other access to the domain, the knowledge. You have to have uh, the ability to convince the field that you are doing it. So flow is, is necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient for uh, getting big C creativity. And, it's, and also in small C creativity, flow is very often there. People can experience flow, learning how to cook a new dish, or uh, writing poetry, or gardening, or whatever. They can have flow by doing this work in a new way, in a more exciting way. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks. My question is related to uh, the larger model that you had in the gatekeepers, because if we have uh, a small opportunity for Big C to get into the culture then what is the responsibility of those gatekeepers? And, and who do you see those gatekeepers today? Are they corporations, media? And what's their responsibility to get Big C into the culture so that the rest of us in the middle can then take the responsibility to evaluate what is that uh, Big C? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the fields can be uh, they are not formal usually. I mean, they are not formal in the sense that they are legal entities that are given the power to legislate or to choose among new ideas. But they develop almost kind of over time as being the middleman or the middle, you know, the conduits between the generation of novelty and the adoption by the culture. So that, for instance, uh, as I mentioned in the fine arts, the gatekeepers have to uh, have a kind of loose confederation of critics, gallery owners, uh, uh, collectors, these these and teachers in, in the better known art schools, the people who write books about art. These are the people who will judge and evaluate the new, new work. And they have no mandate. You know, it's something that evolves over time, and we just assume, OK, they know what, they, they have the knowledge. Now, what can we do if the field is not good? Um, if there is any way to become part of the field or to create a, another field, that will uh, select different entities. And this happens all the time. I mean, uh, for instance, let's say in psychology, there was a field of psychiatry before Freud. And it was very medical and very hospital oriented and so forth. And Freud said, wait a minute, there is another way of doing clinical psychology. And he started his own way of doing it created a field around him, a domain. And then out of this, then other people, let's say humanistic psychologists or Rogerians will say, oh, no, we can do better. We, we do it. And they form another little field. So it's, as I say, it's a contested um, thing. And if you know how to improve on the field, you should definitely try to do it, you know, either individually or by organizing people who are interested. What you're saying right now really leads right into my next question. 
According to Time Magazine, you've spent some time at the beach with Martin Seligman and others discussing how to attract new individuals into the study of positive psychology. And my question is, we have a room full of people that could be attracted into positive psychology as they're just beginning their careers. What, uh, what are the big questions that remain to be answered in positive psychology? Uh, that's a, uh, almost like I set you up for it because that is something I talked this morning about the fact that when we started positive psychology as a movement about eight years ago, seven years ago, I took this model of creativity uh, purposefully as a way of changing psychology, at least in part. In other words, Seligman and I decided that we should provide a new domain and a new field in order to attract young people. And I don't want to go into details. I will talk about that probably when I meet with the psychology people too, because we, we followed a, a set of steps that um, made this kind of new movement very vital in just a few years. And I'm not saying it's going to stay or it's going to have a, uh, a long future. I don't know that. But I know that in a few years, it, it really produced a lot of new books and new research projects. You ask what are the new questions that is, uh, we should be studying. Um, I can't answer that because I'm always surprised what young people come up with, which is completely new and I never thought of, would have thought of. Personally, I am studying now something that I like to call psychological capital, which is another take on different forms of capital that the social sciences have been dealing with, cultural capital, social capital. And psychological capital is um, a new way of thinking about resiliency or some of the other old ideas about how to make life better for people. But so for instance, um, we had a competition for fellowships for studying the psychological capital. We had 102 people applying and we selected two because we had money to support two people for two months in Pennsylvania, uh, the University of Pennsylvania where Seligman is and I will be there. And we invited some of the leading neuropsychologists um, to come there and talk to us about how to control attention because in the kind of model of psychological capital, I am developing the ability to control attention is the kind of basic uh, skill. And the first year we are going to study how, uh, what you can do about the nervous, uh, your nervous system to make sure that you are controlling your attention, that you can sustain, select, sustain attention over time. And um, the second year we will look at psychological capital over the lifespan from childhood to old age. And the third year we are going to look at institutions that support the formation of psychological capital. But that's just my, mm, that's just my interest. There are lots of interests, for instance, uh, a group with Ed Diener from Illinois are trying to develop a national measure of, of the positive life that could be used with the census. Um, uh, there are other interesting things. George Valiant uh, who, from Harvard is uh, going to focus on spirituality and the contribution of spirituality to positive psychology. So, um, there are going to be almost an infinite number of interesting questions. And if you keep track of the literature and look at the website, you will see what's happening. And it's happening very fast. It's kind of neat. Okay. Regarding your uh, 
we'll see. Regarding your studies, uh, the ESM, where you yeah. page the people throughout the day, right. and you uh, had them uh, report their mood or what times of day they felt, you know, more in the most in the flow. Uh, was there any type or time of day or activity where the most uh, creativity was reported, like at night or at work? Yeah, interestingly, uh, creativity is usually reported mostly uh, when people drive a car, and then when they take walks. Um, in other words, generally, and this this actually fits with what this big C creative people also say, that it's easier to get new fresh ideas when you're doing something that takes a little bit of your attention, but not much, and you let the rest of the mind kind of come and go and go into new places. And uh, if you're trying to follow an idea by sitting at a table and try it very hard at your desk, and it doesn't seem to work. It's better to, to kind of get to the new idea obliquely from the side, so to speak. For instance, uh, one guy I know quite well, uh, uh, Alan Kay, is the guy who developed the Apple computers and the mouse for the computer and so forth. He worked at Xerox Park as a researcher. Um, he found that many of his best ideas came when he was showering. So he asked his boss to install a shower next to his office. <laughs> and they counted all the beans and they decided, well, it cost $14,000 to put in a shower. No, that's too much. So uh, a few months later, he was asked to move from Xerox to Apple. And he went there and he asked as a condition of moving there that he would get a shower next to the office. And Apple built him one. And he figured, he kept track. And I don't recall the exact number, but I think in the first two years, he, he checked off that the ideas he got in the shower contributed about 400 million to Apple. <laughs> so I think that is typical kind of for many of these people. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, that was a nice group and a nice group. Anyway, thank you very much.